everyone, and welcome. I'm Carolyn Nukamaludo, the chair of uh, CMC Board of Trustees. It's great to see everyone today. We welcome you. Today's Metropolitan Club Forum is Why Kindness Matters. It's sponsored, sponsored by State Auto and Palmetto Construction, who are represented here today by many friends and associates. Won't you please help me thank them? Now please welcome Elise Spriggs, Senior Vice President, Associate and External Relations at State Auto to introduce our forum and speakers. Elise. Thank you, Carol, and thank you for those that are attending this today. On behalf of the 2,000 associates at State Auto, we are pleased and honored to support the mission of the Columbus Metropolitan Club to provide a public forum on topics of importance to our community. We all know a little bit about kindness. Kindness is a behavior marked by ethical characteristics, a pleasant disposition, and a concern for others. It is known as a virtue and is recognized as a value in many cultures and religions. In a world filled with words like racism, disrespect, resentment, spiteful, mean, bullying, words that are the opposite of kindness. We offer this positive conversation as a contrast and as an intentional act of kindness. Please welcome our speakers today, the president of Otterbein University, Kathy Crendel, the, <laughs> the founder of Heart of Unlimited Boundaries, Rocky Grimes, the chairman and CEO of Sophisticated Systems, a state auto board member and founder of My Special Word, Dwight Smith, <laughs> and our host, senior VP and manager, Walter Family Philanthropy, the Columbus Foundation, Kelly Griesmer. Kelly, stage is yours. Well, welcome everyone, and um, we are here today to talk about something that I think many of us have taken for granted. Um, and I have the great pleasure in my daily, uh, my day job, um, as well as my not day job, to spend a lot of time thinking about kindness and the impact that it has on us as a community and, and as individuals. And, um, a great pleasure of my work is that I have come across um, all of the speakers today in some form because they spend uh, a good deal of their day jobs as well thinking about kindness and um, I'm excited um, to hear as I'm sure you all are um, about what their perspectives are with regard to why kindness matters. So we're going to dig into it, though. This isn't a fluff topic. This is actually something that we're so happy to see a full room, um, because I think it is something that is going to require some courage on all of our behalf. Um, so let's get to it. We, our question is why kindness matters. And um, what's at stake if we don't make kindness matter in our daily lives? This, this is a witness of kindness. We all looked at one another, wanting to be kind, and said, you go first. So I, I please. <laughs> what happens if we don't do it? Kindness, honestly, is what makes the world go round. I mean, a lot of it would say it's business. But for every business transaction, there's thousands of human interactions. And if there were no kindness in those interactions, most of that stuff would not occur. And we were chatting about this a little earlier. We live in a great country, a country that we all love, but at this point in time, we seem to be so divided. So why kindness matters is because kindness will be that shining light that brings us back to greatness again. Little acts of kindness, great acts of kindness, but we need kindness to come back home. And I'll just weigh in, I guess, with um, a little bit of a story. I um, am very grateful uh, being at Otterbein to the way in which Otterbein and the Westerville community have kind of embraced the idea of kindness as a significant initiative for us, and we'll talk more about that in a minute. But what, what happened for us recently in Westerville was a terrible, terrible tragedy with the loss of two police officers. 
And what happened is instead of that dividing us, I think in many ways it brought us together because we have such strong bonds and such strong relationships. It was the kindness that people have demonstrated to one another prior to that terrible tragedy and the way in which acts of kindness then continued to sustain that idea of partnership and of community and of care and of kindness. Um, and then we saw it again last week when we, state, when we hosted the State of the State event. Again, people came together around something that was a celebration this time, the celebration of Governor Kasich coming back home for his final state of the state. So I guess what I have experienced in Westerville and at Otterbein is the importance of those acts of kindness that bond people together. And so much of what you hear about today is what drives us apart is the problem, people feeling isolated, people feeling alone, people feeling that nobody cares. So um, I, I guess I feel very fortunate to be in a situation where kindness is a, a very everyday word and very much part of what we think about both as a city and as an institution. So we'll get more detail as we go, Kelly. Well, you know, it's interesting as I was thinking about this conversation, um, and if you look back historically, you know, um, there, you know, theologians have been talking about kindness for a long time, philosophers, um, all kinds of, um, there's quotes and, and things that we see, and I came across one that said, constant kindness can accomplish much. As the sun makes ice melt, kindness causes misunderstanding, mis mistrust, and hosp hostility to evaporate. And that was Albert Schweitzer in 1875. So this isn't new. How did we, how did we stray so far from understanding um, that that's something that could break down these things, these divisive things that we talk about so often? And, and, and do you think he's right that it could actually melt those types of walls? Oh, there's no doubt he's right. Um, our organization, The Hub, my mission is to build meaningful relationships between individuals of all abilities and economic backgrounds in an effort to improve the quality of life for all. And, and that's a very broad statement, but basically is you see a lot of kindness within a given community or a given race, but where we break down is when we have to go outside of that. And that could be due to lack of understanding, that could be due to enculturation, what we were taught as a child to trust or not trust. And the more we put each other in a room, the, the more we're going to break down those walls. I've said once that if I was president, the first thing I would do is we wouldn't have two sides. Not that you don't have two, dim, two, two parties, but I would make them all sit in assigned seats, right? Because it's really easy to buddy up with your side and cheer and do all that. But if you're the one you know, guy over there that's sitting beside someone else, you're more likely to start to understand their position a little bit more. So bring us together more and let us understand each other more, and that kindness will automatically come. And to piggyback on that, kindness toward a stranger. It's always easy to be kind toward people that you know. But when you walk by a stranger on the street and you say, good morning, good afternoon, hello, those great words like please and thank you, we never know what's going on in their lives, the suffering that they may cause. They may be suffering. And so just to be able to lift up one's spirit with a kind word or a smile, everyone here doesn't it feel good when you receive that? Doesn't it feel equally as, as, as well when you give that? So kindness is something that you can never give too much of, and kindness is something that it feels just as good to give as it does to receive. Well, it, and, it, it's and it's priceless. Sci it's scientifically proven, and I think you guys might be do, doing a study on that, but you can see it out of UCLA or Berkeley. They've done studies that physically and psychologically you benefit not just the person giving or receiving, but anyone who witnesses that act. How powerful is that, that anyone who witnesses the act of kindness gets that shot of dopamine or serotonin or the endorphins that not just make you feel better, but make you want to do a nice thing yourself and physically changes your body for the better. Mm -hmm. How can we not be kind when we understand this scientifically? Yeah, I think as we've been looking at the literature on this pragmatically, the response is, you should be kind. You live longer, you live healthier, and you live happier. So it's a very logical thing to do. I think one of the challenges is to try to figure out how to make that something that one repeats on a regular basis. Um, but it is true. They can study this from a cognitive perspective in terms of changes in the brain. Chemically, the body changes. And they refer to this in the literature as experiencing the warm glow. Um, and you see it when you, when you 
initiate an act of kindness or when you receive an act of kindness or when you witness an act of kindness. It does something to your body, it does something to the way you view the world, and it does something to the way you view the people around you. And, and Kathy mentioned literature. So I'll refer to my favorite literature, and many of you know this. Uh, I'm a very committed Christian, and my literature is the Bible. And so when people ask me about kindness and why is it important, I think that Jesus Christ, this is my personal opinion, was the perfect example of kindness. And because of my faith, I want to live like Jesus, and I want to walk in kindness. So that's my speech on literature and kindness. <laughs> right back to the good book. Well, you know, and it, and it is interesting. I mean, that's exactly what I found when I, when I did a little bit of this research. You know, uh, Thomas Jefferson um, actually said, I believe that every human mind feels pleasure in doing good to another. So again, this is something that isn't new. And that's before we could do the brain scans. And before we could, now we can watch it happen digitally. Mm -hmm. And can we track it? I mean, is it something that's, you know, we talk about a ripple effect, right? And, and the, the fact that um, sometimes, you know, the kindness not only goes out, it comes back. And I think, um, an, you know, another uh, great quote was Marcel Proust said, kindness is difficult to give away because it keeps coming back. So why, why are we, you know, what, what, what do you think it is about that? What, what have you seen in, in, in your experiences where that kindness has not only been put out into the universe, but it comes back in so many ways that sort of feed each other? Well, one of the things I can say at Otterbein, because this has been something we've been focused on for almost a year now, um, we started the process by having those who were graduating at commencement last year write a note of thanks to a faculty member or a staff member, just to say thank you for some difference that they might have made in their lives while they were an undergraduate student. And I think many faculty and staff were surprised when they got those notes. But what happened was it launched a whole series of initiatives. And so it comes back to us now in terms of the way in which, and this will make Kelly happy, we are working to make it contagious. So um, as we talk about this, we see other elements. So it was really started by an initiative with our graduating class, but it has come back to us through student activities, uh, through student affairs, through our community plunges when students go out into the community to provide service to agencies and schools and so forth. Other parts of the campus are not picking this up. So when we have a town meeting, the group organizing it might say, let's make this, let's, let's have this focus on an act of kindness or something in which we can give something back. So when it becomes part of the regular vocabulary of the community and it becomes part of what people think about as a way to put a name on something, that's when you know it's being succeed, it's being owned by everybody in the organization in the culture. Other experiences with, with kindness, the sort of the boomerang effect? Well, if, from my perspective, I mean, with what we do, uh, I am just engulfed in kindness. Not just for what I do for the individuals uh, and what individuals have done for me, but I work with individuals with special needs. And that entire network that supports that community. Um, it's hard not to go even a few minutes and see something beautiful, see something kind, and see the re it self-replicate, you know. Um, so I understand the challenge clearly of taking something that's seemingly trite and getting someone to understand how powerful it actually is. I mean, I'm a grown man that plays with toys for a living, right? <laughs> I, I have, to, I have to bring people out and let them see firsthand how truly impactful this is. Because at first you think, yeah, that's cute and that's nice and that's sweet. But if you engulf yourself in it and you see the impact, you see it replicate, um, they walk away believers. I think also when you, I, I guess I appreciate the Columbus Foundation kind of taking this on as a major initiative through the big table conversations and the big give and then um, kind Columbus you begin to see this playing out in different ways in different parts of the city and in different organizations. And um, I don't know, there's something about labeling it and making it a regular part of our vocabulary and then reminding ourselves it affects the way you respond to a situation or the way in which you interact with someone. Um, 
So we have Kindness Matters as a little pin that we wear, and it's kind of a reminder to people that that's what we lead with, is kindness. Um, one of our trustees gave me a mantra bracelet that says, be true, be you, be kind. And every morning when I put it on, it's kind of like just a little reminder that, oh yeah, <laughs> this, is, this is really important. It's something that I should keep front of mind. Um, and those labels and reminders and vocabulary, I think, are really significant in terms of predicting our behavior and affecting our behavior. I think too. I think it's necessary because we need to be reminded. You know what prevents us from being kind. I think it's uh, self-centeredness, and, and I don't mean that from a negative perspective. I mean that it's perfectly natural that our needs and our wants uh, consume our thoughts. So to be reminded that there's someone other than yourself out there will allow you to do that. What's so fascinating to me is that you know our brain becomes stronger at whatever we do. It develops so that we become better at whatever we're trying to achieve. So if we're trying to solve our own problems and focus on ourselves, we become more powerful at focusing on ourselves. If we can deviate from that a little bit, if we can start to look outside that, your brain is naturally going to start to cause you to do that more often and become better at it. Just remind me that I'm supposed to do it, right? Mm -hmm. And so you mentioned earlier uh, my special words. So I'd like to do 60 seconds on that. So the concept around special words is we've been asking children, what is your special word? What is the word that you would describe the person you are or you aspire to be? And why did you choose that word? And we hear words like love and respect and family and friendly and athletic and all that. But many, many children, which is great hope for the future, come back and say, my special word is kind because I want to be kind. And the thought process there is words are really important and impactful. And if we can change the words that we use, we can change the conversations we have. If we change the conversations we have, we can change behaviors. And if we can change behaviors, we can change the world. Isn't it great when people say, I want to be kind, and I'm committed to living that out? It's a small thing. But kind is not just a word. It's an action, it's a value, and it's a lifestyle and it can change the world. Yeah, baby. <laughs> well, I, Sorry, but you got that. <laughs> well, and, and I think what's important about what you're saying is this concept of saying it out loud. Because I will say that through some of the activities that we've done over the past year or so of piloting kindness in the community, um, I find that the community is incredibly shy about their kindness. If we, you know, social media is what we do, we film our food, we film our shoes, we film our new car, you know, um, our kids' trophies. Um, but when we ask people to prompt them and say, tell us something kind you did today, the number one response I got was, oh, no, no. I, I can't talk about that. I'd be bragging. So how, how do we get people past that? that hurdle that this is the best part of their day and if they share those moments of kindness they're really creating the examples you're talking about for the, everyone they're inspiring every you know every time they share it every time they're willing to say it out loud they share it and hopefully inspire someone else well i think you know, one uh maybe those some of those individuals didn't perform an act of kindness I I, i'm sorry right there's a certain percentage of them that did not you're right but, but they're thinking about it now right? okay i hope so, yeah you gotta hope everybody you guys, had a little so, bit but uh, i i think it can be viewed as weak you know, unfortunately, it's like, it, you know, how it takes the bigger man to walk away, right? You can be the guy that stands there and ready to fight, but it takes the bigger man to walk away. Um, someone who wants to uh, exaggerate or wants to talk about their kindness, uh, they might be viewed as weak by their peers, you know? If, you, if you're on a football team and, and you knock the guy down on the other side and you pick him up, you know, that's a great act of kindness, but what are your peers going to say about that, you know? Hopefully say, hey, great job, let's be team players here, but probably not. So I think being viewed as weak or being strong enough to not just do the act of kindness but be proud of it just takes a certain type of personality. I, I guess um, as I think about this, I think a lot of people don't stop to think about kindness. It's a kind of... For many of us, it's a kind of habitual response. So I'm not sure that we've really talked about labeling things as acts of kindness. I think that's why this kind of conversation is very useful. You put a name on it, you own it. And that's very important, I think, for us from a behavioral perspective. 
you can do things naturalistically from habit and so forth, but when it becomes sort of front of mind and you say this is an important thing for us to be thinking about, to be talking about, and make it explicit, um, I think people begin to think more about it. I think it's that habitual kind of thing. It, it kind of grows. I guess I wanted to pick up on one word that you've used a lot, and I think we've probably all thought about this, but the, and that is the concept of community. I think community is really important um, in, in this conversation. Um, when you think about acts of kindness or you think about things like making kindness contagious, um, again, that sort of ability to put your arms around it in a very tangible kind of concrete way, this is a community initiative. And um, I'm going to tell just a really quick story. Um, I went to a, a race um, a couple of years ago. I, I wasn't racing, I was walking, but anyway, um, uh, it was a, a 10K. And so anyway, I went and um, there was, uh, and there were a number of Otterbein folks there, but there were also community folks. Anyway, there was um, one young woman standing off to the side and um, I went over to her and just said, you know, I just wondered, you know, what brought you here? And this was a memor memorial race for one of our students who had died in an accident, a kayaking accident, he'd drowned. And um, so it was a memorial to raise money for his scholarship. And she was off all by herself looking very alone. And she said to me, um, well, I'm coming to Otterbein in the fall. And I read about this event. And I thought, I'm joining the community. And I need to do things that will help me understand that community and engage in that community. And you're all doing this to remember someone who died in a terrible accident. I want to be a part of joining your community in this way and participating. And I thought that was a really brave thing and a really thoughtful thing and a really kind thing mm -hmm. to do. But that idea of how you define your community is really important. And that's one of the ways that Otterbein defines its community. We try to be a kind, welcoming, inclusive place. And she realized that and that it was important for her to celebrate those values and embrace those as she joined our community. And I think kindness isn't necessarily an, an intentional act. It's part of the fabric of a human being and of a community. And it's interesting because I consider Columbus to be a very kind community, but I'll give you two examples. My lovely wife, Renee, sitting there. Uh, we, we travel, we visited a city recently. We flew in, caught a train downtown, got out of, walked out of the train station, and within a half a block, a stranger came up to us and said, hello, you look like you may be lost. May I help you? We're looking for such and such place. And they said, go here. They practically walked us to our hotel. You know, that's kindness. Now, on the other side of that, we visited uh, another city. Notice I'm not naming the cities. And, and, <laughs> and when, when I'm on vacation, I do the baseball camp and the flip-flops and all that, and I speak to everyone. And I remember being in the city and walking down the street for a block and saying, good morning, hello, how are you? To a dozen different people, not a single person spoke back. Mm -hmm. Looked down, looked away, and we kind of said, city number one, we can't wait to get back to. City number two, maybe not. I think Columbus is city number one on steroids. Well, and, and that's actually, you know, that's a great point, which is, you know, I think that we know a lot of groundbreaking things happen in, in Columbus, in our greater Columbus area. Um, is it crazy to think we can be an example for the United States or the world when it comes to seeing other people and connecting with each other. I don't think it matters if it's crazy or not. <laughs> it's, right. it's important. <laughs> I mean, it's something that um, I think there's great communities. So you've seen such tremendous response, and we're seeing this play out in so many different ways. So many different parts of the city, so many different organizations are grabbing onto this. I, I don't care if it's crazy. Yeah, absolutely, if it works. I mean, you can't deny it if you look at what's happening at TRC and autonomous vehicles. If you look at there's so many different things we can reference. And if we're at the forefront of that, then they need to catch up. Yeah. <laughs> and maybe social media. You know, there's a bright side and a dark side to social media, right? It can share love and kindness or hatred. The other thing is social media sometimes makes us insensitive because we'd rather talk to our iPhones than to one another. It's pretty hard to be kind to an iPhone. It's pretty easy to be kind to the person sitting next to you. So maybe we ought to disconnect and have conversations and display kindness. Well, 
first we said, you know, there's definitely a little bit of a love hate with social media because it is such a powerful tool to be examples for each other, um, but both good and bad examples. Um, so let's talk about examples a little bit. Um, personally, or, or at least something that you've seen. You know, I know when I focused on kindness, one of the things that I tried to do was make eye contact with people and actually see people as opposed to just brisk, you know, running by them day after day. And I was shocked at the end of a few days how impactful it, like I literally waving at people at bus stops, you know, and, and, and you think, <laughs> why am I doing that? And it's because it started, my brain starting to change. So how about you? What, what kindness do you do or you try to do in your daily lives and or um, have people done to you that's had an impact that, that is, has made you um, better? Um, this is a very timely example for me, but I am in the process of, of uh, getting ready to retire. And um, I was just saying to somebody um, before this all started, it's interesting when you say, you know, my, my retirement's been announced and people start telling you all the wonderful things <laughs> that, you know, and I'm sure there are some terrible things, but um, <laughs> it's just been, it's, uh, it's very affirming and you, you know, you realize that things that you did at some point in time that didn't really seem significant to you actually had meaning for individuals and they've remembered them. And, um, and there's something that, helps you kind of reflect on yourself, but also reflecting on the importance of those relationships and those actions on a day-to-day -day basis. So um, I have started saying please and thank you more frequently to um, staff around the university because often we're just transactional, we gotta get something done. Um, but pausing just to say, I know you're busy, but I, w I really appreciate this, it's important and we're on deadline, so I wish we could really move this along, um, makes a difference in terms of how people respond and their willingness to really participate and take ownership of this is the kind of community we are, we work together to get things done. And, and I really love when you said please and thank you, I'm right there <laughs> with you. The, the other thing is that when you have a conversation and an interaction, to be present. I mean, it's really interesting, you know, sometimes people say, how are you? And you could say, I'm dying a quick death. And they'd say, that's great, have a nice day. <laughs> no, that means they weren't present. But, but I think the most important thing that you can give, you know, as it relates to kindness, is your time, being presence, and your attention. Now, you ask about kindness and how it's impacted me. Um, one of the most important things someone can give you is their time. You know, you can create wealth and all, but time is very limited, and I'm gonna get in trouble for this, but uh, there's a gentleman here that has been extraordinarily kind to me with his time, his insight, his friendship, his counsel, and his love. And I was fortunate uh, to sit next to him today, and that's my great friend, Mr. Lewis Smoot. He is one of the most <laughs> kind of people I've ever met. You have no idea how much trouble I just, just got in, but <laughs> I'm hopeful he'll be kind toward me as we go. I think you just r respecting them for who they are. So I think one of the reasons I'm very successful in working with the individuals that I do is honestly, I do not see the disability. I do not see the different confirmations or the different speech challenges. I treat them exactly like I treat anybody else. I allow them to be exactly who they are and not feel ashamed of that. And I think that's how we need to look at everybody. I mean, to not look at the race or the collar or what they wear on their head or the tattoos, it doesn't matter to me. It's what you have to say and what you do that matters. So allow someone to be themselves, uh, regardless of whether you necessarily agree with it. Because if you don't, they're gonna put up defenses. The minute we put up these defensive walls, we're not focusing on communicating, we're focusing on protecting ourselves, right? So you have to be able to just relax and attempt to understand the other person, allow them to be who they are, and eventually you'll, you'll find a connection, you'll find a common ground somewhere. And if you give kindness and you don't receive it back, that's okay. You never stop giving. All right, so I'm gonna um, just let you all know that we do, um, at the end of the program, we always take questions. So we are at the point where if you have a question or something that you're thinking about, um, please um, line up by the mics um, because we will start to take those questions in just a few minutes. And as just a, you know, a follow-up um, to the, the, those cards on your tables, which can seem you know, like what a strange little art project that is. There's some markers and there's these notes. And, and the idea is really to just see those people, the people who are living in the shelters in our city right now need a word of encouragement. They need to know that so many people show up 
every week at something like this to learn about our community. And whatever you put on that card, it can be, like we said, empathetic, it can be motivational, it doesn't matter. Your kindness can be what your kindness is. But we hope you'll share it um, and say it out loud, sort of the way we've been talking about today. So I guess as you all think about sort of the challenge that you have um, for people walking away today, what we can do with our young people, um, you know, we hear that children have this already in their lexicon. Um, how do we help them not lose it on that football field? How do we help them go to class where they are facing things like school shooting drills? How do we teach them that they're supposed to hold on to that concept of kindness as they go forward? I think um, what I'm seeing in our students is the ability to take action. Um, they, they are not silent. They are not um, stepping back. Um, they, I'll give you an example. So um, I guess after the election in 2016, um, our students came back from Thanksgiving following the election and saying, I just couldn't talk to family anymore. I, you know, I went home. It was the first time I was home, and I couldn't. I, you know, the election just has me kind of confused about how to talk with people. Um, what they did as a result was they formed um, what they called a day of unity. They felt it was important, both with their colleagues, fellow students, and with their families to be able to find common ground. And so they wrote a pledge, and they had people sign it. They had a big banner in the library, and people had to sign it. But it was really about, we respect diversity of ideas. We respect individuals coming to their own conclusions. We need to be able to talk about that. We need to find common space. And I, I guess I take a look. Well, I'm spoiled because I'm around 20, you know, 18 to 22 year olds every day, and then beyond that. But um, you know, it just gives you a, a sense of optimism about the future. These are kids who want to take action. They want to engage, and they know that their actions are very important, and they're very concerned about um, how they do that in a constructive way. So, I find it very affirming in terms of them taking hold of these concepts. That, that's awesome. I want to back it up a few years. I want early intervention. I think we need to take, you know, to the best of our ability, that zero to three to five year old, that age of true brain development and start focusing on that too because that's where we start to map those neurons that decide what we're going to do and to your point of social media or being stuck on the phones taking pictures of purses and shoes. Why? Why do we do that? But it, <laughs> Excuse me. But Right there is where brain development is occurring. So make an extra effort to get those kids out there, socialize, let them see different, different individuals, different environments. Because if we don't, it's a lot harder to fix it later than it is to instill it at the early age. So whether it's your child, whether it's neighborhood children, engage them. And the more that we can engage them in diversity, and the more we can show acts of kindness, the more apt they are going to be to do that as they get older. And I think it's important to reinforce good behaviors. You know, too often we look to catch people doing something wrong and criticize. Why don't we work a little harder to catch people doing something good in the compliment? I mean, we work with these children when in need, if you say, my special word is kind, and you walk in front of me and open the door, right? And I say, young man, young woman, you're living the dream. You're living the word. You <laughs> just go. displayed kindness. So behavior that is reinforced becomes stronger. Let's look for opportunities to reinforce, starting at a very young age, and let them carry that forward. All right, well, I think, um, again, if, if for those, um, it looks like we have some questions, so we'll get started with that. And then um, uh, certainly if you have one, come on and get in line. So the floor is yours. First of all, thank you, CMC, and, and um, you four for having this very important conversation on this timely. Um, when I was raised, my, my parents raised me with this idea that, that humanity had this unlimited capacity for kindness, and it was warm and fuzzy. But as an adult and as a scientist, I can safely say there's enough data that says that's true. So for example, if there's a tsunami in Indonesia, if there's a hurricane in Haiti, if there's you know, gun violence in a casino, what have you, Westerville, I mean, you name it. Tragedy has people forget race, religion, gender, and people come together in tremendous ways. What is it about, the, and, and by the way, when the tragedy is forgotten, we kind of settle back to our own, I hate you, or I dislike you, what have you. So what is it about tragedy um, that, that does that, and is there anything we can learn from it? And I'm not suggesting, yes, have a tragedy every week to get people to be kind. <laughs> but what is it about that that clearly rubs away this issue and everybody is kind in any given environment that's affected by tragedy? I, I think it brings it back to our own mortality. 
And when you see that occur, you empathize with that, right? Just like you see kindness occur, you want to do it. When you see that tragedy occur, you recognize real quick that could be me. And you're willing to do whatever's necessary to prevent that from happening to you. And whether that means disregarding race and everything else, that's what you do, at least for a short while till you fall back into that comfortable part of your life. But we should need tragedy to bring us together. Maybe the, the real question is, what can we do to make it sustainable? You know, we do come together when things are rough, but we must learn to stay together. It's kind of like in families. You get together and you say, boy, we only get together at weddings and funerals, right? We're not going to do that. We're going to spend more time as a family. And then the next time you see each other is two years later at a wedding or funeral, right? It's got to be sustainable. It's got to stick. I'll just add one note, and that is that I, I guess this whole um, area of conversation as we've been talking about it over the past year or so has reminded me that there are lots of tragedies happening around us every day in people's lives and we just don't know it. And so that idea of being present and, and owning things, talking about them, labeling them, I, I think um, it's everybody has a, a tragedy uh, at some point in their lives or multiple tragedies and being sensitive to that, being present when you're confronted with it is, is critical. So I think those big tragedies can remind us that there are those kinds of things happening in people's lives every day. My name is Barbara Pratzner, and there's an incredibly wonderful uh, book for school agers out there called Wonder about the issue of bullying, and it's now a full-length film. So my understanding is that uh, one of the lines from the book about choose kind has now sort of become a mantra for classrooms around the country where whole classrooms are reading the book together. So my question is, are any of the panelists familiar with the book or the movie? And can you speak at all to the impact of the book or the movie and the choose kind movement? I am not familiar with the book or the movie, but I have seen some of the exercises that teachers are giving children in elementary school about a kind checklist um, and exercises and class projects related to it. Um, so I see this penetrating throughout the education system and across age groups, um, but I apologize, I'm not familiar with the book. I, uh, I saw the movie. It was fantastic. Anyone here that has not seen it, please do. Uh, and it was really about this young man who was unique in his own special way, but what he had was courage to be himself. And the movie kind of dis put on display the importance of family coming around him and saying, you're different, but you're okay. And it's your uniqueness that makes you special. And people were not kind to him, but I think he overwhelmed others with his desire to be kind. It's a fantastic movie. Thank you. Hello, my name is Mark Matson. I'm a VP of Human Resources for a local engineering firm. Your comments are inspiring my comment. Uh, Kathy, you mentioned retirement. Um, and the ultimate retirement is death. Um, <laughs> Thanks for reminding you're me. Welcome. <laughs> you're welcome. On that note. I'm also thinking about retirement, but my father uh, passed away two years after his retirement. He was taken by a heart attack. He was a high school graduate and an appliance repairman who went in and out of people's homes over 45 years. Um, he didn't have any credentials, if you will. He didn't amass wealth, lived in a simple home with my mother who was a homemaker. His funeral mass was at 2 p.m. on a Thursday and when my brothers and I walked into the church, it was absolutely packed. And I, we all asked, who are all these people? Um, and in the receiving line, I met these people who, and they all talked about my father's acts of kindness through the course of his life. One woman for whom he shoveled walks after she was recovering from a surgery and her husband had died, said, your father was the kindest man I have ever known. And I've never forgotten that lesson. And I hope that when my ultimate retirement comes, <laughs> that those same comments can be said about me because I think that was evidence of a life well lived. Absolutely. Thank, Thank you. you. Absolutely. Amen. Right, next, next question. Oh, hi. My name is Renee Delane from Women Who Dare, and I just wanted to make a comment about men. Men matter. And I'll tell you what, too often we put them in that masculinity box where they have to be brave and strong. And I've heard women say as well, he's crying, ugh. 
You know, for gosh sake, we're all just human beings. We're all part of humankind. And um, I just wondered if you, any of you in the panel had anything to say about how we can help men become the human beings they were meant to be. <laughs> yeah. Well, help a guy out. You know, I, yeah. That is tough because you do have to maintain. I think, you know, for me, part of it was, it was my children. You know, I learned a few years, many years ago, it's unlikely I'm going to leave them an inheritance, but I can leave them a legacy. And so I've worked hard to do that. Uh, so they, and my wife, of course, beautiful Kathy, uh, are the ones who inspire me and give me that courage to not really care what the other folks think. I mean, when you see me out there, if I'm working with a four-year-old, I turn into a full-grown four-year-old <laughs> because that's what it takes, right? I have to be willing to embarrass myself to achieve my goal. Um, so really, if you look to someone else that can encourage you, you're more likely to do it. And, and this whole macho thing, I don't get. I mean, and maybe it comes with age, letting go of that. And Renee would tell you, we go to movies or we're just, or if I'm out with kids and, and they do something great, I'll just start crying, right? And I've gotten confident enough and comfortable in my own skin that I don't try to hide that like I've got a cold. No, I'm having an emotional <laughs> moment and that's okay. And, and sometimes it actually allows other people to feel comfortable and, and join you in shedding a tear. There are tears of sadness, there are tears of joy. And, and you know, I don't have a desire to do this, I have a desire to be transparent. And sometimes that means crying. And I would just say as a woman, it's very important to reinforce those behaviors when they take place. So positive reinforcement can play a role as well. Yeah, yeah we like that. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> All right, thank you. Next question. Yeah, my name is Bipender Jindal. I am VP of CTL Engineering. We were having a conversation. The way I see it is that kindness is universal law just like gravity. It applies to all living beings. And we were discussing that somebody asked Buddha 2,500 years ago if there is a God. And his reply was, no. But when you are in peace and harmony with yourself and your surroundings, you are in the presence of God. So then the person said, how do I feel it? How do I know that? So at that time, Buddha said, at the grossest level, any time you do any action towards anybody, such that which gives you goosebumps, you are in the presence of God. And you will find whenever you do something for other people, it makes you feel good. That scientific evidence you were talking about, it has been proven. So these things have not changed. One last thing on that issue, that the reason kindness seems to erode away is from the beginning of time, there has never been discrimination based on color, race, gender, nationality, or religion. These are only the means. The root cause in Indian philosophy, they said, was the human urge to feel superior and control others. As long as we continue to fight towards that, we will become a better human being. Any comments on that? Amen. 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 There you go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Carol Harper, and I'm with Ohio State, so I work a lot with college college age students, and I really find that the word kindness resonates with them, which is really an exciting thing to know. That this next generation coming forward after me um, is also excited about the topic of kindness. Um, but what I do find is that sometimes when I talk with different generations, the word kindness makes them roll their eyes a little bit. So I'm wondering if you found any other words that are similar to kindness or synonyms that you think resonate with different generations. Um, people talk, and when they do research on the notion of kindness, they really talk about things like empathy and altruism, um, that ability to take someone else's perspective, walk in someone else's shoes. Um, that is the way in which um, a lot of social scientists talk about it. Um, we, we've reverted to kindness. We like the kindness word, but, um, but um, there are, if you, if you look at the research literature, that's the way, those are the concepts that are closest to kindness that they've get, actually given definition to. 
I don't have a synonym, but uh, you know, I do a lot of speaking with at-risk youth uh, for multiple reasons. And when I see that, those become my targets, right? When you see the one that rolls their eyes, that's the one you need to go focus on. <laughs> well, I hear words like respect and dignity and friendly, and, and a word that I hope we all get more comfortable using, which is love. I mean, if you want people to just kind of shudder, start asking them to talk about love. And, that is true. But isn't there a song, What the World Needs Now Is? Love. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Hi, everybody. My name is Diana with a Y, and I want to thank you. Well, my heart feels wide open. I'm so grateful to be here, and I happen to work for an Otterbein graduate, Maggie Ellison, who brought our table here today, and I'm so lucky that I get to work in a kind environment. And it's been on my mind, and I have a million dollar question. Are you ready for a million dollar question? <laughs> it's been on my mind because I'm in the next level trainings, and that group, I'm in a leadership program, and the purpose of next level trainings is to create a transformed world, to go out into the, the communities that we're in, and to spread the love and kindness to heal the world and to transform what we're doing. And I moved back to Columbus from the New York City, New Jersey area after being there for 20 years to Columbus. And the thing, and this is a million dollar question, the thing that's really been heavy on my mind since I've moved here is the safety. And I guess my question is, we're all enrolled in kindness and we're all kind people, I'm sure. And the question for me is, and I've been struggling with this, how do we, how do we change the course of 140 homicides from last year? What could we do as people in this room? We have over 200 people. And what can we do to change where we live? And how can we change the course of, of Columbus? Because I'm proud to be from Columbus. I went to Eastmore. And my own high school's changed dramatically. And I'm deeply involved and committed in uh, volunteerism in Columbus. To, to be on that track, and I just want to invite conversation around that. Thank I, you. I, oh, no, ahead, no, please. please. No. I say it just takes a lot more people to commit a lot more time. You know, quite frankly, you have to dedicate, you have to allocate the amount of time. You know, I'm a firm believer that if this young person's been in this situation for three or four years, it's going to take six or seven years to fix them. It's not a single act of kindness. Not that that can't change someone, but rarely is it a single act of kindness that will change somebody's perspective. It takes consistent um, interaction with that individual and showing them kindness. So. Start to spoon feed them small so they don't get intimidated, and little by little, show them love. And you have to have the will to make a change. I mean, I, I've always believed it applies to America and applies to Columbus. We have enough innovation, money, and resource that no child in Columbus or across our country should go to bed hungry, should not have a good education, and good health care. We have the resources. Thank you. The question is, do we have the will? And it will start by breaking down the barriers. Right? We shouldn't have 55 different agendas. We've got one agenda, which is to make our world a better place. Hello, my name is Yatsari Monroy, and I'm a student at Cristo Rey Columbus High School. And I'm a, school, a student intern at IGS Energy, and I have a quick question. What advice would you give someone in my generation on how to speak out and be kind considering the negatives around us? Um, I know that us teens, we do want to spread kindness, but right now in this generation it's kind of hard considering all the bad things there is, hatred, racism, and it's just hard to spread it out there. And I feel like some teens just want to close their minds and just not spread anymore. So. For us that do want to spread kindness, how can we, considering that students don't want to? Don't speak, act, right? It's real easy to show your voice, but show your actions. Don't ask someone to do something. Do it yourself and, and be the example. Because um, you're right, it is hard, especially at your age, to stand out from your peers. If no one is being kind and you're the only ones being kind, that's tough. But I would say suck it up. <laughs> and, you know, lead by example and others will follow. And, and I, I think action is super important, as you said. The other, you remember I mentioned that my special word? And so a young lady, a few years younger than you, she might have been 12 or 13 years old, uh, we asked 
people to come up and talk about their special words. And here's what she said, and it stuck with me. She said, my special word is confident. She said, because I'm an athlete, and when I'm on the field, I'm confident. And when I'm in the classroom, I'm confident. She said, you know why? Because I don't allow others to define myself. I'll do that myself. So just be confident and don't succumb to peer pressure. Be yourself, be your light, and your light will brighten the path for others. Thank you. I think we have one last question. There we go. Um, so my, so I go to Ohio Wesleyan, and so I'm surrounded by a lot of college students. And like my question is actually about like the definition of kindness and how it gets a little skewed in there. So, so I see that people at my school they're very concerned about like kids in Africa, or they'd be more willing to go rebuild houses like somewhere far off in the world, and they'll associate kindness with that in a much greater level than they would with like ongoing cycles of poverty in their own area, or like people who are much closer to their age and draw and like geographically closer, people who they have more resources to help and they won't be as inclined to do so or they won't feel like they're being kind when they're doing that, but they'll feel very kind when they'll go out of their way or like even like take a flight and go help people. And like I feel like there's this like gap in capacity building there or like this gap in understanding. And I just I, I just don't think that empathy has to be selective or it doesn't have to be like a disaster of like a very high magnitude for someone to just be concerned concerned about someone like across the street. So I, I was just wondering why, like, I feel like because of that, that's what's made people feel like kindness is just like a fluff kind of word to them. So I, that's how a lot of people at like I've, or my age or like people in my school have been associating it with such words. Yeah. That's an interesting observation. Very interesting. I, I appreciate you bringing that. I think that they're underestimating what a small act of kindness can do. You know, yeah, I want to go after this great big elephant, right, and prove to the world what I can do. And they're just underestimating what that little thing can do. So help prove what, what they can do. You know, a small act of kindness is huge in, in many, many ways. I guess I would just say, um, I think as we've talked about this, um, owning the idea of kindness and defining it and talking about it, there are so many needs, I think as we just heard, there are so many needs in our community. Understanding really the community rather than feeling like needs are things that take place elsewhere. Needs are things that take place right here. And so finding those groups and organizations that they can become involved in to understand more about community right here and right now is very important. Um, I think we always have this sense of things are okay here. Um, things are not okay here. And so figuring out how to navigate, to take action, to do things that are going to make a difference right here and right now is really important. Yeah, never, never hesitate to educate those people you right. know about the things around them. And, so th yeah, yeah. And, and it's interesting because when you think about kindness, and I was really thinking about your thought, when there's an emergency and something that's very visible overseas and people get on that plane and they go, uh, sometimes kindness is a response to a tragic situation. Sometimes kindness is just kind. There doesn't have to be a need for people to be kind. Right? It's kind of like if you're out shoveling your snow and you go ahead and shovel the snow of your neighbors, it's not that they needed that. There wasn't a need. You just did it because you wanted to do it. So maybe we ought to separate and, and stop thinking that kindness is only required when there's a need. Kindness is required, period, and leave it there. And you can view and share today's forum on all of our and all of our forums on CTV, Columbus Television, and WOSU and PBS affiliates statewide, through the Ohio Channel and anytime on our CMC website. Um, and remember, next week the forum is on bullying, cyberbullying, and our children, another very very important topic. So we hope to see you then. Uh, please let me help me thank our sponsors. Um, Palmetto Construction and State Auto, thank you very much. And of course our speakers, Kathy Krendel, Rocky Grimes, Dwight Smith, and Kelly Grismer. Thank you.